Welcome to Women Lit Unbound. I'm Kiski Holwerda, Program Director, and I'd like to welcome you to our first live Women Lit Lunch Hour. Women Lit is a close-knit community that elevates women's voices through literature and conversation. Members receive access to these live virtual events, salons, and our brand new monthly newsletter. Of course, there are a lot of other mem member benefits the rest of the year, including early access to in-person events, member receptions, and ticket discounts. If you'd like to find out more, become a member, or renew your membership, just visit womenlit.org. Your support during this time is crucial, so thank you so much. A quick note about two more Women Lit Unbound events coming up soon. You can see Irish novelist Imer McBride on May 21st. She took the world by storm with her award-winning debut, A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing, and her upcoming novel, Strange Hotel, is just as genre-bending and entrancing. Coming up later on June 4th is Pulitzer finalist Louise Aronson discussing her latest book, Elderhood, a realistic and joyful redefinition of aging. Women Lit members will receive registration information straight to their email and can always contact us at womenlit at baybookfest.org with questions. Now, speaking of questions, we'll be taking a few audience questions at the end of the program. If you would like to ask Chelsea a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. That's different from the chat function, which you're also welcome to join. Finally, if you would like to purchase a copy of Godshot, and I promise you, you want to read this book, we encourage you to order from one of our indie bookstore partners, which you can find on our website. And now I am beyond excited to welcome Chelsea Beaker, debut author of the fantastic new novel, Godshot, and Brooke Warner, author of Ride On Sisters and fearless publisher at She Writes Press and Spark Press. Welcome Chelsea and Brooke. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Fabulous. Hi, Chelsea. Okay, it's you and me. Welcome. So good to uh, be on with you. And I feel like a couple in the first couple questions, I'm hoping that you'll set a little bit of context for your book because I don't know that all listeners will have read it. Uh, it's about so many things, but one of the things it's about is a is the protagonist is drawn into a cult, and cult writing is kind of a genre all its own. And the Chicago Review noted this, saying that there have been a lot of feminist coming of age meets cult novels, and Godshot is a worthy addition. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about setting the context for that and whether what you like I guess I want to ask what you knew about this canon before you started Godshot and whether you were inspired by any of these novels or whether Godshot came more from your personal experience yeah I think overall Godshot really started with my personal experience um, earlier drafts of the book were so focused on the mother-daughter relationship and this tiny town and there was a church that was definitely a part of the town. But with each draft, I deepened the complexity of that church. And slowly, it sort of raised up as more of an influence on the people of the town. I think when I was thinking about the environment and the way I wanted to heighten different tensions of the book, it sort of happened organically. But looking back, I, I can see it clearly that maybe it was an attempt to get the environment even more claustrophobic than it already was by having this cult influence um, on the town. And I definitely grew up in a church environment for part of my childhood. I didn't personally experience what's in the book, this really <laughs> tiny town in the cult, thank goodness. Um, but I think I was witness to a lot of groupthink and sort of these overarching truths of my church community around things like women's bodies and sex and women in leadership that felt claustrophobic and felt kind of culty in their own way. And so I think some of that's infused here. And of course, it's fiction. So I'm always finding or trying to find ways that I can really heighten the tensions and get characters in close proximity to one another to really see who they are. 
And you do that very effectively. Um, and so I, I want to, again, maybe set a bit of context and ask you, um, we have a, people listening right now, so I want to say thank you to all of you who are here, welcome, and people who will be listening on Mother's Day night. And so I just kind of want to acknowledge the mother-daughter aspect of this book. And I think it's a perfect thing to be writing about, actually, and reading about and thinking about Mother's Day and mother relationships. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you a bit of a personal question, uh, which is, of course, out there online to find. Um, but your own mother left when you were nine. And there are some pretty clear overlaps in God shot with your own life. Your mom was also an alcoholic, also fell in love with a man that she met on the phone. Uh, and I work with a lot of memoirists and mother abandonment is one of those topics that shows up a fair amount. And uh, it feels so baked into the DNA of writers who are unpacking this topic. So my question is whether you considered writing Godshot as a memoir. That's a great question. Um, I think, so in my early 20s, when I, I entered a MFA program for fiction and was primarily writing fiction at that time, and I took this memoir writing class as sort of an elective. And I kind of strode in thinking like, I know my own story. This will be a piece of cake. Um, I know what happened. And I sat down to write this personal essay that was assigned and really was met with a lot of blocks. I really couldn't access the truth of my own story at all. And I felt this emotional upheaval and fear come up when I tried to. I just don't think I was ready on my sort of self-growth journey to dive into some of those topics head on. And so fiction was more of this intuitive way to get at the emotions that I was feeling without actually looking at my exact life. Um, and as I've, you know, that was 10 years ago. And now I am dabbling a little bit with personal essays and writing more head on toward the truth um, of, of certain things. But fiction has just always appealed to me as the way that I can access my truth in, in this freer way, I guess. Um, at times in the book, I would be writing about the mother and daughter together, and I would think, well, just say what happened. Just write what happened to you, because that that's a good story. But I don't know. I just felt block to, to really do that. And I, I, fiction just seemed like the way in. And I do think, and I hope that one day I will write a memoir. I want to, I feel compelled to, but I'm not sure I'm ready yet. And I think I'll know when I'm ready. I, I'm getting closer, but I'm just not there yet. So <laughs> Yeah, that I makes don't know. a lot of sense. I mean, I think <laughs> that um, oftentimes fiction is a way in, and of course, the truths on the page are there. Um, I mean, you're a you're a young writer. I mean, I think that's also you're quite prolific for your age. This is a a huge deal. And I read uh, in one of the interviews with you that you were very conscious of that, especially you already have two children. That someone said this is going to set you back five years and you were determined not to let that happen. And so it seems that you're well on your way. I wanted to ask you about, I mean, it's interesting with the context of the memoir maybe being out there um, in your future. If you could talk a little bit about this two book, two book deal uh, and how is it that you came to sell a novel and a book of short stories? Um, I, I think there's a lot of people listening who are aspiring writers themselves who would love to hear just a little bit about how that came about. Yeah, definitely. I def I started out writing short stories. I still love that form so much. Um, it feels like possibly even my favorite form a lot of times. And as I was writing Godshot, I was also writing stories at the same time. It felt like a way to get away from the book at times moments where I just didn't want to work on it anymore, or I needed a break and I would go write a story or, and I think it was kind of subconscious, really. There's a lot of overlap between the two books. I kind of picture them as like distant cousins. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that they're so overlapped that you could say that 
that they're somehow fully entwined, but the places reoccur, there's different reoccurring characters. And I think I was maybe subconsciously trying to explore the world in a, in a bigger way. Um, but by the end of writing the novel, I realized, oh, I also have like a ton of these stories um, that have come out during kind of the same time. And so for me, it felt, I felt in love with the stories in a way. Um, and I wanted them to be published too. And I think I, it felt important for some reason artistically to have them sold at the same time. Also because I was ready kind of to move on from them and mm -hmm. the book. I felt like I didn't really want to hang on to this collection um, anymore. I've been, I mean, some of the stories are really old, like 10 years old. I just felt like artistically I was ready to kind of, um, yeah, let them out into the world. And so I really, I wanted them to sell. So it was a bit time. of a strategy to, to package them together in that yeah, sense. Yeah, okay. I think That's so. Yeah, I, I'm glad to hear that. And it's interesting uh, to just know people's publishing journeys. I'd love to go back to the book for a second. This, for those who haven't read it, uh, Lacey May is your protagonist. She is growing up in this, it's fictional, obviously, because the, the drought is bad, but maybe not hopefully this bad um, in real life. So in this town, the drought is so severe and the people have sort of been taken up uh, with this fundamentalist uh, man who claims that he can save them by bringing water, which has happened once before. So I just kind of wanted to give people that context. So uh, I wondered if you could tell the readers or the, the listeners out there rather, um, because I, I thought it was so interesting what it means to get God shot. And after this happens uh, to her, you know, this based on an assignment that she's given, there's moments when Lacey May basically wishes that she could go along with it. You know, there's this wishful thinking. It happens several times in the book where she realizes her life would be easier if she just could go along with it. And I would, wondered if you could talk about that in general. I mean, I think it's a human tendency, but why you had her in that space of just saying, well, what if, you know, what if I could just be okay with all of this and then I would be okay? Yeah, I think you're right. It is kind of a human tendency to want to feel like we are agreeing to the right things, that we're in the right place in life, that we found perhaps the ultimate meaning of life. Um, I think in some ways we search for that in all different ways. And it would be easier for her life in some ways to go along with it in the beginning. I think as things escalate, she can't ignore her intuition anymore about it. Um, and then she also meets this whole cast of characters that aren't really on the inside fold of this cult. They're more outskirts. They kind of live in a neighboring area. And it's impossible for her to maintain her original belief when she's seen these people outside of the cult and some of their perspectives. It's just like when we read literature or we travel for the first time or we leave home, we're confronted with different perspectives. And we're forced right. to reckon those with our core beliefs. And often that complicates things and that changes us instrumentally. And I think that's what happens with her here. And the women she meets, especially the women running the phone sex business, she's completely turned around in terms of the way that she sees women, the way she sees her body, the way she sees sex. And she really gets an education that's that's impossible for her to look away from. Uh, and speaking to the title, is it too much to give away? Well, the title in ter is... In terms of your inspiration or what it means. And it's okay if it yeah. is. You can tell people <laughs> by the book because it's no. amazing. Yeah, we. I can talk about it. It's the, I mean, there's probably many people have heard the term God shot. It's kind of a term I grew up with that I heard in the church and also then later in recovery um, circles where to be, to be God shot is like, kind of like you're driving, you get a front row space at Costco and my grandma would be like, Oh, it's a God shot. You know, 
there's like a, it's sort of this idea of synchronicity or luck or that God's just up there kind of shooting you a little blessing here and there. Um, you meet the right person at the post office. It's a God shot. And I think it has different meanings for everybody, but it's sort of this sign that you're on the right path. So that's the way I first encountered the word. And I remember I just felt like there was something about the word itself, the way it felt in my mouth that was kind of weird. Like it was so abrupt and it had this like kind of a uh, rhythm to it. And also the two words together felt uncomfortable. Like shot is such a violent <laughs> word and then, right. but it's right next to God and and also this idea that your actions and your worth are indicating your worthiness of, of being blessed. So it's conditional. Um, and all of that was really programmed into me and I couldn't really let that word go. And then I kept encountering it. So it found its way into the book and then I kind of repurposed it. Mm. So the church is using it and then the church is using it in this other way that's a lot more sinister but is masked to be the biggest blessing of all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. I yeah. hadn't heard the term, so it's fascinating to hear you unpack that. I, I want to go to this phone sex business that the women from the outside are in because there is this clear current in the novel about women doing sex work, right? I mean, there's the women who are doing the phone sex, there's... Uh, also, once Lacey's mother leaves, she goes to Reno and the seediness of what's happening there is sort of alluded to that it might be pornographic, but you don't really say that. Um, and I was wondering about girls and women who want to be stars, they're trading in their beauty. You know, I mean, you're clearly offering a bit of a commentary on this. So it's less of a question and more an observation and just a, a curiosity about what you wanted to get across by showing this world to your readers. Yeah, I think for me, I wanted to show a little bit of contrast between the way that the phone sex business operates here and the way that um, where Lacey's mother eventually ends up working in Reno in a really different situation. I think the phone sex operation, the women are really holding a lot of power in that. Um, even the way they are talking to them callers and there's a sort of empowerment that's occurring, even though I don't know if in mainstream ideas, they would see it as that, but I think in the book it is empowering in a different way. And it's a way for these women to, I mean, they kind of think of themselves almost as counselors. Like they're the literally the last house on the block for men to express desire or need that's not filtered by this kind of toxic masculine um, idea. And, and they do hold a lot of power in that. And and also they're removed. So they're in a house. They're not having physical contact with anybody. And, and they've taken back some of their agency in that way, I think. But then in Reno, we see this other version where it's not, it's not healthy for the mother to be involved in that probably. And, and it's a, a really different world. And I don't know. I don't want to make a general commentary on phone sex or on mm -hmm. sex work in general, because I just don't know enough about it to do that. Um, but I wanted to show different perspectives of, of what that could be like and, and mm -hmm. how that might work. It was effective. So thank you. Yeah. I mean, it felt like the range of things that the women were doing and the levels of empowerment and the levels of, you know, men controlling them, this quite a range clearly. Um, if we could go to back to California for a second. It plays such an important part in your book and you grew up in the Central Valley. You went to Cal Poly. Now you live in Oregon. Uh, I was just wondering about place and its importance. I mean, I also grew up in Southern California and I'm a little older than you, but I remember so well growing up in drought and three minute showers and the impact that that has. And so I was, I, I'd love for you to talk about this extreme drought that this town is in and they seem almost like there's not even a consideration of leaving, you know, even to go to Fresno or they just don't have options and, um, and the role of place in Godshot in California's importance to you. 
Yeah, I, I felt that writing about this place and to leave out the fundamental issues of its environment and the drought and the fires that always neighbor everything, you know, it's an interesting geological space in that it's a valley and it's really a bowl. So everything gets trapped there. All the toxic smoke from wildfires, you know, exhaust from cars, everything stays. It's like this atmospheric pressure that um, it's so bad. The air is so bad that often you can't see the mountain ranges that are, that you should be able to see. And sometimes when we have a rain or it clears up, suddenly there's these gorgeous Sierra Nevada mountains, but really up close. And it's kind of confounding that they're even there. So it's eerie. Um, mm -hmm. That space has always been so ingrained in me. Obviously I grew up there. Everybody has some tie to their hometown in that way. My grandfather who ended up raising me after my mom left, um, he had started the agriculture prog program at Fresno State and was just very involved in the land. Even in retirement, he really held on to the weather systems, you know, this sort of obsessive thinking about frost, drought, you know, will it rain? What's going to happen to the harvest? We were, that was always a topic of conversation. Um, and, and I think that that was just in me and it kind of came out in this book and, and also the, the kind of contrast where you mentioned the three minute showers and I remember certain households having labels in the shower that said like three minutes, you know, or timers that took it really seriously. <laughs> right. But then so many times you see that people don't want to acknowledge it or just it's not in their general, it's not up front. They're still watering their grass that I, you know, in the book, they're painting their lawns green. That would actually probably be a good solution for people in Fresno um, to not have grass to water. Often, I remember growing up, we'd see the sprinklers just going off into the gutters and it feels wrong. Once you know about the situation, it, those things feel so wrong, but right. it's definitely happening all the time. And um, I don't know. So all of that, I wanted to bring that complexity in of how you can live in a space and ignore it. You know, in the book, there's people from Fresno who are kind of still going about their daily life. It's really not that big of a deal to them. It's just the way it is. They're still buying bottled water and they're fine. But these people in this tiny town are not able to look away from it. They're having to find a solution. They're in poverty. They're, there's no other options, but to face it head on the way they do that, of course, is this uh, misguided way, but they are reckoning with it in their own way. Right. <laughs> yes, they are. And there's a lot of desperation and these incredible scenes you write where Lacey is drinking bottled water. It's like m mana <laughs> from yeah. heaven. And it's it's effective. You feel that, certainly. Uh, I want to ask you about your writing. I read this in a pen interview. I, I love this. You said, I love reading my own writing. I love the act of writing. I always have, long before I wrote anything that met the light of day, I write cackling at the screen and why not? You have to have some swagger for your own art. There's a lot of rejection along the way. Don't reject yourself. Uh, it's so refreshing. I see so many writers doubting themselves in their writing, being so self-critical in a lot of ways, being their own worst enemies. So how did you learn how to be in relationship like this with your writing or has it always been so? I don't know that it's always been so. Um, I think when I entered my MFA program, I didn't really know what I was doing in life. And very quickly in that program, I realized that being a writer was absolutely what I wanted to do. It felt like the purest truth I'd ever stumbled upon. And I felt like I would do anything to not let that go. And so I don't know, maybe it's entwined a little bit with just that determination of, of finally finding something that I felt like I could be good at. I wasn't a good student. I barely ever went to high school. I barely graduated. I barely went to community college. It was all sort of hanging by a thread until I found writing. And so once I did, I don't know, I guess it was the first time I felt like I could be confident in something. And, and that just kind of grew. And, and it is true that 
it was a place I was finding a lot of joy. Mm-hmm. And I did feel that 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 could not possibly be bad. That hmm. certainly not everyone would want to read what I wrote or even think it was good. But that didn't seem to negate the joy that I was feeling. And so I guess now, I don't know, when I go to write, that's like, uh, that feels like playtime to me. That feels refreshing and really fun. And I think if we start thinking too much about outcomes and you know, you're, you're writing alone. You're alone. You don't know if anyone's ever going to buy your book or read it. So that's scary. And I think it's easy to get hung up in all those unknowns and, and really focus on the outcome. And I think as soon as I do that, it opens the door for too much trash to come in. Um, I can't really create in that mind space if I'm worried about submitting or, or (laughs) thinking about a reader on the other end. I hear that a lot from writers. It's not usually helpful to think about readers necessarily while you're writing. Um, maybe in some cases it works, but yeah. I And then I think mainly though, becoming a teacher and hearing the insecurities of my students and hearing the same insecurity over and over, which feels really rooted in the question of like, do I have the right to be a writer? Am I a writer? should I be doing this? Am I wasting my life? You know, and, and just hearing so much self doubt and then asking, well, what's your, are you writing? And often the answer was like, well, not, you know, not really. Cause Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just like, I'm nervous or I'm worried. And, and it just seems so clearly how that is such a block for us. And it happens to everyone. I I remember reading the artist's way and, and, she talks about the sensor. That's the sensor voice over here. That's ultimately so unhelpful. You can, but I think not acting like it's not happening, but just being like, oh, that's my sensor. Hi, sensor. What do you have to say? I hear you. Thank you for that. You can go now. Like, it's the same thing about, you know, feeling an emotion really heavily, like anxiety. It's, not trying to push it out or act like it's not happening, but being like, hello, hi, anxiety. I feel you. What message do you have for me? Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. You know, it, I've just found that that diffuses those voices and allows me to move on. Um, I don't know. I love that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very helpful. And, and it's interesting because on the one hand, you're talking about joy and all of these things, but of course there's so much at stake with writing as well for people in so many ways. You've said that stories save lives, which also I think for some people might feel like a pressure, even if they've been so inspired by a book that felt like it did save their life. And so this question is maybe twofold, like which book saved your life? And as you're writing Godshot, was that ever a pressure, you know, something you aspired to? Hmm. I think the first book that felt like that for me was White Oleander by Janet Fitch. I mm. think it was the first book I read where it just hit the feelings I had right on the nose about this loss of the mother where she's still in the world, but she's not accessible. Um, and I mean, that's such a beautiful book. I mean, that is it just is. <laughs> like this sensational yeah. book. I'll never write White Oleander. Um, that exists alone, you know, on the clouds of the literary heavens. It's this beautiful mm-hmm. thing, but trying not to hold myself to that standard. I'm not Janet Fitch. How could I ever write White Oleander? Um, but I can write something else that's true to me and will be true to my natural ability and style and inclinations, um, while also being so inspired by these writers who have created these works of such beauty that, that are really inspiring. But I don't know, as soon as I'm like, well, will I ever be as successful as Janet Fitch? I mean, that just slams the door in my face to anything I might ever do. You know, it's like, well, I don't know. Um, I know that my path is not Janet Fitch's path, you know, so I can't compare myself. Um, comparison is the thief of that joy, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and, I've heard that said a lot and it's hard to do, especially having a book coming out. You're, you're kind of conscious of, of things in a different way. And 
Um, but it's, it's always unhelpful to compare. Truth. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, so thank you. And, uh, you said that you come from a family of forgetters and that's clearly not the role you're playing in your own life. So can you talk about what this means? And do you think that you're draw being drawn to writing is uh, kind of a result of that? Yeah, I've been thinking about this so much lately. And I think that my inclination to start writing as a child was because my world was so chaotic and often, you know, when you're the child of an alcoholic or an addict, there's a peak of disaster. You, you're always riding a wave. And then there's the come down where it's the next day. And like, maybe they're not at that peak anymore. So things are either not talked about at all, or they're brushed over, they're made okay in some way, or they're just lied about. And it creates a confusion where you're like, am I making things up? Am I experiencing the same things other people are experiencing? Um, and as a kid, I just, I was like, I need to write this stuff down so that I don't forget so that I don't become confused by all these other truths that I'm, that aren't reliable. Everyone's truth is subjective and so is mine. But also, you know, maybe it was a way to just stay sane in those moments where you're being gaslit or you're just being told, like, that never happened. Um, and, yeah. and you're like, well, it did because I remember it and I was not blacked out. So, you know, but, but the inclination to, to get it down felt important because it was this physical artifact that I could point to. Um, hmm. But Yeah. So you originally wrote the story from the mother's perspective and then later realized the story had to be told from Lacey Mays. How did you know to listen to that voice? Well, I heard it so clearly. I just remember waking up the morning after I had finished that kind of first fledgling draft and it just said, write it from the daughter's perspective. And I heard it and I, I think I spent like breakfast thinking like, no, I don't have to do that. I just <laughs> did this other thing. It's fine. But I knew as soon as I was saying that, that it was wrong, um, that I would have to listen to that voice or at least experiment with the voice um, and see what was there. And I think it was truly just a way to get closer to the story that perhaps right at the start of things, I couldn't do yet. Um, mm. And, you know, writing from the daughter's perspective would be a lot closer to my experience than writing from this older woman's experience of being the mother and also looking back on the situation. It was um, so different and it felt suddenly important to get a lot closer to the situation. Yeah, there's that truism in writing about starting close to what you know. And I think so many writers try to sometimes say, oh, I don't want to do that for exactly the reasons that it's too close. And then you've gotten so much attention and accolades for the voice. And so it just made me curious to see the difference, <laughs> you know, to, and maybe we'll get to see some of that in the short stories. Do any of the short stories come from the mother's perspective? No, no, don't. so disappointing. <laughs> I guess there's still time to write one and sneak it in, but no. Yeah. All right. Maybe, maybe you will. <laughs> yeah. uh, so th I think this will be my final question. I have others, but I'd love to turn to see what the audience says. And I have more that I can intersperse and, you know, I love hearing what, pe what people out there are thinking. Uh, I came across this personal essay in Catapult. Um, that you wrote called Why We Must Believe Women, My Family's Legacy of Violence and Murder, which is quite frankly, an amazing piece. I was very moved by it for all sorts of reasons. Um, you're talking about the legacy of your aunt having been murdered, but there's so much about your own feminist awakening in that and how women are treated and your own anger. Uh, so thank you for writing it, first of all, um, and thank you for writing Godshot. But I wanted to read this little snippet because most people are going to be watching this on Mother's Day. You have a you have two kids, but you have a daughter, and you wrote in the catapult story, 
I'd like to teach my daughter to protect herself. I'd like to teach her not to be thankful for the leering eyes of a man on the street or the groping hands of a man at a bar. I'll teach her that she is the ruler of her body. And I'd like to imagine a world where she can go to the grocery store at night and not walk fast to her car with keys poised like a weapon. Um, So again, just very moved about the experience of being a a woman in the world and this feminist awakening and what legacies we pass along to our daughters. And I was thinking about your mother and her legacy to you and your legacy to your daughter and wondered if you had any words you'd like to share about that experience on Mother's Day. Yeah, I mean, I think becoming a mother, I was so struck by the influence that I would ultimately have on my daughter, um, just because I know the influence my mother had on me. And there's a lot of pressure in doing things right. Or, But my goal, I guess, I'll never be a perfect mother. There's <laughs> way too many <laughs> things in the closet for that. <laughs> But I can be a different mother and I can be really overt. I think one thing that was missing from my childhood that would have been helpful was just people saying the thing, saying out loud, like, that's not okay if that happens to you. Mm -hmm. Um, No one was saying that. And maybe they thought it was implied, but it was not implied if you're a child. So I say things really directly to my daughter. Um, And I hope that we can keep that channel open. I mean, even just the way I try to talk about bodies or the way that I don't try to infuse shame in things like a menstrual cycle or, you know, she knows more at five than I probably knew about my anatomy at 25. I mean, Mm -hmm. and that's real. She's... I think she's on a a really heightened path that I was just not on. I felt like I was playing makeup, you know, once I kind of was cued into some of these different truths where I was like, oh my God, like all the ways that I was playing into um, some of the things we're just conditioned to as women. (laughs) And it's also a survival. I was just surviving as well. And also, you know, thinking about my mother, I see the ways that she was such a product of the society that she was in and the people around her and the ways in which she was a victim of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And what that does to a person is so traumatic and it shut her down so completely. Um, In some ways, as I get older, I'm able to see the ways that she was actually tremendously strong in the face of everything she was enduring. As a kid, you don't maybe see it that way, but but the older I get, the more complicated it gets because it's impossible not to recognize, you know, the ways in which no, again, no one was saying to her explicitly, this is not okay. Um, and I hope that as a mother, I can just say the thing. Well, you're off to a good start with this legacy <laughs> of writing. So thank you for that, Chelsea. And uh, I think I'm going to, turn it over to Kiski for some questions from our listeners out there. Hi, everybody. All right. Um, So first question, what is the editing and revision process like for you versus how you write a first draft? With the exception of the perspective change from the mother's voice to the daughter's, was there anything that you had originally included in Godshot that didn't make it into the final version? Yeah. So... I think now having written a novel, you know, at the start of writing a novel, why would you know how to write a novel? You've never done it before. You're learning as you go. It's a lesson in how to do it. And I also think it's a specific lesson in how to write that novel. Um, But as I was going, I guess I'm the kind of writer that puts a lot down and then has to chip away versus the other way. Um, So there were a lot of story threads that never made it in. A lot of the editing of Godshot was actually deleting. Um, As much as as painful as that is to say, how many pages were probably deleted is quite a few. Um, Probably a whole other book was taken out. Um, But ultimately, it was about shaving it down to its most essential form. And I did my best with that. There's probably still sections that could be deleted. But um, 
yeah, just realizing that the other threads in the book were possibly just things that I wanted to write about, or I was having fun writing about, but were not essential to the story that seemed to emerge through doing so many drafts. And of course, I didn't come at those realizations alone. You know, I had an agent that was reading it and offering perspective, and then ultimately an editor who was offering perspective. So of course, those kind of guides are so helpful or, or a reader who can say, you know, this storyline just doesn't seem to fit anymore with the draft you have now. Um, but eventually, I just got used to cutting and it didn't feel so difficult anymore. It felt, ne- it felt necessary. Um, ooh, I can give another question. Um, yeah, I think I'll, uh, let's keep taking some questions from the audience. And if something occurs to me, I'll, uh, I'll give you a symbol. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, okay. How did the relationship between place and character help write each other? Um, you balance light and dark in the novel so well, especially in writing place. Um, the birthing center versus the church, um, her grandmother's collection of taxidermy. Um, it seemed really fun to write and also a way to help us understand Lacey. Thank you. Yeah, I think I thought so much about place in terms of, you know, this is such a devastated environment. It's so dead. Everything is monochrome. It's brown. Um, it's dirt. And there's nothing growing. And so for me to kind of almost relieve myself of those landscapes, I had to infuse some color and texture. And I think that, you know, I can see that after having written it, that I was Mm -hmm. trying to enliven some of that energy and the people there are also desperate for beauty and for things growing and they're doing their best. They're painting their lawns and they're wearing all these bright colors and they're forming these, what we might think of as strange collections of things. Um, but it's sort of their grasping at life. It's sort of a way to find meaning or something exciting in this really dead place. And it was fun to write those scenes, you know, the details of like Cherry, the grandmother driving around in a magenta (laughs) purse through this really barren town. Those, I love when books contrast things that shouldn't be in that place. Um, There's a natural born tension there when we see things where, uh, it, we're like, that doesn't belong, but then suddenly it has to belong. Our minds have to find a way to make that, that shiny magenta hearse belong in this place where we would never normally see it. So I liked some of that as almost an exercise to deepen and also subvert expectation. When you think about those sort of landscapes, we just, we think about flat, dead, nothing going on. And I wanted to show that actually there's a lot going on there. Chelsea, just to follow up on that, how uh, intentional were you about the humor? Because it's a dark book in some ways, but very funny in other ways. And were you consciously trying to juxtapose that because you had a darker topic? I think, I, I think that the humor piece is just a part of me. And growing up, I remember you know, my mom and I could be in the most dire circumstance. We could be on the side of the road, car dead, just everything going wrong in 110 degree heat. And she would look over at me and have somehow shoved something in her teeth. And she'd say, you know, do I have anything in my teeth? (laughs) You know, I want to look nice for the mechanic or just something bizarre, but I would be laughing so hard, but it was such a horrible moment, but we were laughing. We're dying laughing. So it's these little moments of life. And she was such a funny woman. She could make you laugh. She was physically funny. Her presence was funny. And then she was really smart. So she had this humor that was, um, it was often very dark and very sarcastic. And it would take you a beat to really realize that what she was saying was hysterically funny. Um, but I think I couldn't help but infuse some of that in to their scenario, just because that's who I am. And that's, Right. It's probably also <laughs> just a coping mechanism. You're like, it can't be bad all the time. Like we have to laugh a little bit at something. <laughs> and maybe give the readers a little bit of relief. Yeah. I mean, if you're thinking about the balance. Yeah. So that's great. Kiski. 
Yeah. Um, you explore a lot of different themes. Was there one that you were tuned into as a jumping off point, alcoholism, addiction, motherhood, religion, or did they all lead to each other? Yeah, I think something I felt more conscious of at the start of writing a book was um, describing the physicality um, and details of pregnancy and birth, which was something I was, I was pregnant with my daughter really at the beginning of writing this book, also realizing that I had never seen anyone give birth before. I had no idea how that was going to happen. No one had talked about it to me. It just felt like this startling revelation to realize I would have to do this thing, but I didn't know anything about it. And um, I was going down sort of a path of self-education around that. I was watching women give birth on YouTube. There's tons of opportunities to do that. Who knew? (laughs) Um, Women birthing orgasmically, women birthing on the side of riverbanks unassisted. This whole world Mm -hmm. opened up to me that I had never seen before. I was like, no, I thought birth was an emergency where the movie cuts away. The woman is off screen. Maybe you get to see the dad like hemming and hawing on his cell phone or something in the hallway. And then we come back and the woman has the baby in her arms. That was all I knew about birth. And lo and behold, there's so much more. So I was investigating that for personal reasons, but I was also interested in writing a book that didn't turn away from that, of what that experience feels like of, and you know, Lacey similarly has not had any sex education, but yet she finds herself in a scenario where she's going to have to get some education to figure out what's going on. And, um, I just wanted to read in literature and I'm sure there are books that don't turn away from it. I just hadn't found personally many that were really diving deep into just the act of birthing or how you prepare to birth or what your body parts look like. Um, And there's a moment in the book where she sees her cervix for the first time. She didn't even know what a cervix was. So Things like that were important for me to infuse into the book. So I was doing a lot of research on that. I was watching a lot of videos of um, also on YouTube. There's so many like YouTube diaries of teenagers who are pregnant and the way that they're emotionally um, experiencing their pregnancy was fascinating to me and the way that they're publicizing it in this way. And so I was watching a lot of that. And that was a big cornerstone. And um, Yeah. The other things came in, but that was kind of where I started. Wow. Um, Okay. There, this is sort of a two part. Um, There were very few positive male characters in the novel. (laughs) Um, Was that intentional? Is gender something you consciously think about um, while writing? I, yeah, I mean, I was consciously thinking about this, uh, I felt that it wasn't really my job to infuse the book with a positive male character that could possibly redeem men as a whole. Um, I was more focused on the complication of the, the woman's experience. Um, in, in this world, there aren't a lot of, of those positive male characters. I would say possibly the grandfather was more of a loving presence for Lacey, but he's off screen. Of course, he dies in the beginning. Um, But yeah, I think it's maybe it's something I saw later um, in hindsight. And I think it was also, you know, writing that essay that you mentioned too, I was really coming to a lot of my own truths about the ways in which I had been oppressed in different ways by men, the way that women in my life so close to me had been brutalized by men. It was just right at the forefront and I had to write about that. And so I guess maybe in this particular book, there wasn't, I didn't feel the need to explore what it would look like to have a a positive male role model in the book. But yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because some of the boys are victims themselves, right? And I, I certainly thought... Lyle's character was complicated. (laughs) You know, he clearly didn't want to be doing what he was doing and was, you know, this, this complication of 
when you are so entrenched in a belief system and you kind of go along with things. And so I did think that the, that cohort of kids basically, because they're teenagers, it was sort of a level playing field in my eyes, you know, in terms of how you treated all of them. That was my impression. I'm so glad you said that. I mean, I think a lot of it too was showing the ways in which boys are from such an early age conditioned to have certain thoughts about their place in the world and, and how women fold into that. And, and I think that was a part that I wanted to show. And I agree that it is so complicated and the boy characters, especially it's pretty clear that they probably don't want to be doing what's happening either. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, All right. I have one more question from the audience. Um, What, if any, works helped inspire Godshot? And what are you reading right now? (laughs) Yeah, so many books were so inspirational. I think I had like a handful that felt like that just felt spiritual to me. I already mentioned why Oleander was a huge one for me. Um, Definitely the writing of Annie Prue. I felt that the way that she writes about place is just like nothing I've ever read in her work, especially Wyoming stories to me. Place is just such a character. It's so vivid. And so that was a huge inspiration. Um, Definitely Dorothy Allison's Bastard Out of Carolina. The way that she writes about trauma, the way that she doesn't look away from trauma as it's happening on the page, and also the way that those characters maintain their agency and the telling of those difficult, unthinkable stories was a huge example of a way in which that could be done thoughtfully. Um, And then, you know, the work of Mary Gateskill was really huge for me, just that sort of dark humor, the turns of phrase, unexpected. I just love her writing and, you know, all of Toni Morrison, Jhumpa Lahiri. Those were some books that I returned to over and over that just felt like, you know, our favorite books, the way they feel to us, they feel like such a part of us. And it felt, it felt comforting to return to those as I was writing this book. And there's many more, I think. What I'm reading right now that absolutely knocked me out. No, I shouldn't have said that because the title is actually the knockout queen. So it's really (laughs) cheesy that I said that, but it did. I got to the last page of that book and just exploded with tears. It was so surprising. I loved that book so much. I actually went into reading it without really reading a whole lot about it, which sometimes I like to do. I don't like to read the description necessarily. I just started it and it was so good. It was just it's such an experience. So I would really <laughs> recommend that book right now. No, oh, that's great. Thanks for that. One thing I read about your process uh, in one of the many interviews I read is that you're very resilient with taking feedback and not too precious. And, you know, it just was, again, it reminded me of the, what I said earlier, just this sort of refreshing quality that you have. Because I obviously I work with writers and I see more people angsting or fighting for things or, or complaining, you know, when they have to go back and do a revision. Uh, So I wondered if you could talk about that from maybe from almost like an advice perspective (laughs) for writers. And I'm, I'm curious about just your relationship with revision and taking feedback. Yeah, I think right away I felt, I don't know, maybe just because of various issues with confidence in my upbringing. When I entered sort of into the workshop space, I was entering and really open-minded and with this idea that I might not know, well, I didn't know everything. I hardly knew anything. I felt like I was just this wide open plane. And so I was really hearing what people were saying in this pure way that I don't know that I'd hear it that same way now, but when I started out, I was like really taking it all in. Um, not necessarily taking it in and then changing everything in my work to fit what every single person was saying that would be impossible, but being really conscious of the voices in the room that were saying the things that felt true to what I was trying to do. 
um, it, it, that seemed like easy to decipher. Like someone might talk about my work in a certain way that would just feel like, Oh, I don't, I just don't feel like they're the reader for it. And I could just move on. But, but listening to the voices that felt like were just on my team in a way. Um, and I don't know, like once I started being published, having such great experiences with different editors at lit mags or, and certainly the editor of this book and respecting them so much and feeling that their ideas about the book or my work were really valuable. And so, but also still, you know, taking everything in and leaving what didn't work, um, trusting the inner voice of my own work. I remember really clearly this writer, Vanessa Vasilka, she probably doesn't remember saying this to me, but I ran into her sort of when I started writing this book and I was telling her about it. She lives in Portland too. She's amazing. She has a book coming out. Everyone should check that out too. Um, but she was like, just make sure it doesn't lose its original energy. Um, and I think she meant like through revisions, just make sure mm -hmm. the book hangs on to that original energy. And that always stuck with me. Um, and so with each revision, I would think, am I like diffusing that original energy with whatever it is for you? Is it the voice that you fell in love with that made you want to write the book? Is it the story that now you veered away from too much? Coming back to some of those core principles that she was referring to as the energy of the book, that was really helpful to me. And I don't know why my brain logged that in. And um, That's great. It's a good to have yeah. a mantra to come back to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and so maybe a final question would just be about writing during this time of quarantine and you have two little kids at home, which is certainly not easy. I relate. I only have one kid at home and it's not easy. And a lot of, I, I, but the fascinating thing that I'm seeing online is like these extremes, you know, some people who are just like, I'm too distracted. I'm too upset. I can't write at all. And other people who seem to really be drinking from the creative well. So where do you fall these days? I am feeling creative right now. I think that's where I go in times of distress. Um, but because of the children being around, I haven't had a lot of time to actually work in a way that I would want to. Um, so there is some tension there, but I think I'm just giving myself permission to do what I need to do in the moment. And a lot of that right now is moving physically. Um, just something about sitting stagnant feels hard and it feels a little bit more healing to be in motion. So that's something that shifted a bit where I might write, but actually now I'm like doing something else, something more <laughs> dynamic with my body. Um, that feels important, but I have also felt like a real deepening with a uh, journaling practice, which is something I wasn't doing much of for the last five years. I feel like since my daughter was born, having a physical journal, what, just for me felt hard. She would like rip the pages out. It was just this <laughs> physical thing that would get dragged around. And once she even took it in her backpack to preschool, imagine my horror at that, you know, so it just felt like it wasn't my tool anymore. But now I've really returned to this idea of, I call it in my head, rage journaling, where I'm trying to make a little bit of time every day where I'm just journaling out my like ugliest thoughts and getting them out somewhere. Um, so, you know, no one's going to see it. I find that to be really therapeutic. And also I often have some creative breakthroughs in those moments that I can later take to whatever idea I'm working through. Um, but yeah, I realized like the only <laughs> writing I was doing was like a social media post or I was like writing something for the book. And I was like, where am I putting my rage? I have a, I still have a lot of rage in my body. It's got to go somewhere. So I've been journaling more. Rage journaling people. <laughs> I think that's not a bad note to end on. Actually, I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea. And uh, thank you for joining us. Everyone, if you would like a copy of Godshot, there will be a final slide when this is over that will guide you to our indie bookstore partners. So I hope that you will buy it. I loved it. I read it in three days. It was that good. So thank you, Chelsea. And I am Brooke Warner. You've been watching Women Lit Unbound. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been so wonderful to be with you all. And thank you so much, Brooke, for your 
wonderful questions. I had a blast. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thanks, Chelsea. 